Mother, how long have we been traveling? Approximately 24 days. Ash? Any suggestions from you or Mother? No, we're still cuddling. I've got access to Mother now, and I'll get my own answers. Thank you. You are listening to Yutani, the podcast for all things alien, AI, robotics, sci-fi, and technology. Hi, everybody. So, I don't know. I've had a lot of technical difficulties this morning. People probably aren't surprised. It happens a lot to me. All right. So, we are going from page... We're going from page 111 to 124. Now I understand my other streams may not have worked, but I did record a copy, so I'll upload them later. going to check something because someone was saying that my stream wasn't working so I had to kind of restart everything okay cool I am live it is working All right. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just a bit tired because I've been fasting. Let me just get a couple of links up for you while I... Go to AVP Galaxy Downloads. If you're following at home, you want to get a copy of the script, you can head over to AVP Galaxy and they have a wonderful collection of them in the downloads section, which I will paste to the screen right now. There we go. So, before we get started, uh, I just want to go through the character list again. So, the cast of alien characters. So you've got to remember that all of this is before the names of the characters were changed and some of the characters weren't fully formed yet. So these are very early concepts and they may not act like their characters should or I'm not in the same situations their characters were in the film. So Chaz Standard is the captain, who is obviously Dallas. Martin Roby, the executive officer, who is obviously um, Ellen Ripley. Del Brassard is the navigator, who is Lambert. Sandy Malconis is a communications tech, who is Kane. Cleve Hunter is the mining engineer, uh, who is Parker. And Jay Faust is Brett. All right. So page 111, I believe. Yeah. They leave the nose of the ship, standard carrying the flamethrower. Hunter, the tracker. Roby settles himself at the controls, runs through them briefly to familiarize himself. Using a switch, he opens and closes the lifeboat door a couple of times. It slams open and shut quite rapidly. He presses a few buttons and sets 
the launch button to ready. Then standard's voice comes from the communicator. Over filtered. We've got something on the tracker. Got to be it. It's too big for the cat. This is a very spooky scene, as um, Dan O'Bannon has written here. Spooky scene. Roby alone by the lifeboat, listening to the voices on the communicator. Hunter overfiltered. It's coming from down there. Roby hears various tinny sound effects, rustlings, clunkings, breathing, etc. Interior, corridor, and ship. Standard has the flamethrower at the ready, and Hunter is staring at the tracker. Hunter says, It must have stopped moving. I'm not getting anything. Standard replies, Let me go first. You stay behind me. Carefully, Standard advances down the corridor. Then the creature pops out of hiding behind Hunter and picks him up. Hunter screams. Ooh, it's getting intense because the alien's here now. Uh, page 112. Standard whirls around, sees the thing clutching Hunter. It holds him off to one side as though to keep Standard from getting at him. Standard doesn't show, sorry, Standard doesn't know what to do. Hunter yells, the flamethrower. Standard yells back, I can't, the acid will pour out. That moment, the creature takes a bite out of Hunter, who screams in mortal agony. Standard can take it, no longer. He raises the flamethrower and fires, but the creature swings Hunter around as a shield, and Hunter catches the full blast of the flame. Standard instinct instantly drops, sorry, Standard instantly stops firing, but now Hunter is kicking is a kicking ball of flame held out at arm's length by the monster. Poor guy. <laughs> All right. Um, just give me one moment. So if you're watching, can you please give us a holler? Because I don't know whether people are watching until you chat in the chat room. Um, because I'm using OBS. I'm not using Twitch. So I can't see who's watching. And I have to keep looking down at my phone and I'd rather be concentrating on the, sh on the script. So, um, yeah, please do that. Okay, so um, <laughs> I want to stop here with the script. Uh, it's kind of funny because picturing this because you know, I'm picturing the alien holding Hunter out, uh, kicking and screaming in a ball of flames like Rafiki does with the lion in The Lion King, holding it up <laughs> but on fire. Uh, I'm going to have to commission an artist to make this happen. All right. Um, okay. So, I'm trying to get back to where I am. Interior nose of ship. Roby is listening to all of the commun to all of this on the communicator he can hear the shrieks and crashing noises then the communicator goes dead and all he hears is a rush of static roby says hello standard hunter he waits quiet oh, sorry he waits quite a while for a response but we can see from his expression that he expects none he drops his face into his hands when he lifts up his head again, he managed to summon a certain amount of resolve. I love this scene in the film. I think Sigourney Weaver portrayed this part very well. And um, 
it's one of the the parts I really enjoy interior corridors and ship Roby walks along watching the tracker carrying the pistol in the other hand he comes across standards flamethrower lying on the floor he picks it up substituting it for the pistol then he continues to follow the tracker it takes him down the steps into the maintenance level Roby follows the device for a short distance until it indicates that the source of the signal is directly under his feet. Looking down, he sees that he is standing on a square metal plate. Getting down on his hands and knees, he removes the heavy plate, revealing a black opening with the ladder going down. Substituting the tracker for, for a flashlight, but still carrying the flamethrower, Roby starts down the ladder. Interior, dark storage room. The shining light around the around sorry, <clears throat> shining the light around into the darkness. Roby descends the metal ladder to the floor. The place is a horrible lair, full of bones, hair, shreds of flesh, pieces of clothing, and shoes. Something moves in the darkness. Roby turns his light on it. Hey, Luna Otaku. <laughs> All right. Hanging from the ceiling is a huge, sorry, huge, <laughs> huge. Hanging from the ceiling is a huge cocoon. It appears to be woven from fine white silk-like material, and it is slowly undulating. Flamethrower ready, Roby approaches the cocoon. As he gets close enough, he sees that the cocoon is semi-transparent. And the body of standard is inside it for those people following at home you'll know that standard is dallas and i just wanted to point out here um, the semi-transparency of the cocoon is still shown in the movie because of the egg and that the alien eggs in alien are semi-transparent you can see the face hugger inside kind of like um the little eggs um, David had swallowed to put onto the Covenant ship. Uh, so, so using the transparent egg as a place to store Dallas's body makes sense because it's from this script, um, because of this transparency in the cocoons. Anyway, back to it. Flamethrower ready, Roby approaches the cocoon. As he gets close enough, he sees the cocoon is semi-transparent and the body of Standard is in it. Unexpectedly, Standard's eyes open and focus on Roby, who jumps violently. Standard says in a feeble whisper, Kill me. Roby, sickened by what he's seen, says, What did it do to you? Standard moves his head slightly. Look. Oh, this part is creepy. Even though, like, I don't get creeped out easily, this I like this part. <laughs> All right, page one fourteen. Roby turns his light where standard indicates. Another cocoon dangles from the ceiling, but this one looks a little different. It is smaller and darker, with a harder shell. In fact, it looks almost exactly like the spores in the tomb. Standard whispers, that was Malconus. It ate Hunter. I want to stop there as well. So now we have a witness uh, that has seen the alien eat. Whereas before, when it was caught in the storage locker and it, they were assuming that it was eating, uh, it was all made out of assumptions. So now we've had someone witness it, but you know, they're going to die. Anyway, going back to the script. Roby looks around for a tool. I'll get you out of there. Standard says, no, don't. Roby replies, but I can save you. Get you to the auto dock. Just want to point out this. <laughs> uh, 
misspelling of Standard's name, and it says Standair. <sighs> no good. It's eaten too much of me. Roby replies in horror. What can I do? Standard replies. Kill me. Roby stares at him in horror, then bends down and takes a closer look at him. Reacting, he straightens back up, raises the flamethrower and sprays a molten blast where the entire room... Sorry. Sprays a molten blast. When the entire room is in flames, he turns and scrambles back... Back the ladder. So I'm, I'm assuming he says back to the ladder. I just want to stop there. So... Um... So this is an alien script, pre-alien, and I want to bring your attention to Alien Resurrection where uh, Ripley is faced with all of her clones, Ripley 7 lying there on the bed saying, kill me. And then having this moment happen to, you know, proto Ripley, which is Roby, um, coming face to face with Dallas being, you know, uh, deformed and turning into the alien and then you've got this uh, kind of balance and um, parallelism with alien resurrection and Ripley 7 uh, already like part of the alien but like grossly morphed and disfigured because of cloning um, I think it plays a really powerful uh, part in the series to, to do this sort of mirroring effect or like this sort of like um these themes have been visited before and they'll play out again because you're stuck in this whole cycle of like life death and rebirth and you know no one can escape it um i really love that about the alien series anyway <laughs> i'll stop fangirling about alien resurrection we're supposed to be talking about the alien script all right Interior maintenance level. Roby drops to his knees and gasps for breath, trying not to throw up. At length, he regains control of himself. Exterior outer space at light speed. The snark appears to hang motionless with planets and star clusters rolling past in the infinite distance. Interior bridge. Roby is putting the cat into a metal vacuum sealed cat box with a little oxygen tank on it. Remind me to add the concept art for Ron Cobb's uh, little cat box because it's super cute. He even draws Jones. <laughs> uh, page 115. Roby says to the cat, Kitty, go bye-bye. Sounds like a weird thing to write in the script, especially considering the whole situation that's just happened. But I guess people talk to animals like that they're their children <laughs> in some sort of like patronizing voice. So I guess this is Roby's way of kind of normalizing the situation. Uh, he seals the cat box and turns on the oxygen. There is a faint hiss of pressurized air. Wide eyed, the cat peers out of a little window in front. It yowls. He picks up the pressurized cat box and leaves the bridge. Interior, mining and cargo bay. Carrying the cat box and a shoulder bag and of course the flamethrower. That's in brackets by the way. Roby goes quickly to the nearest rank of metal canisters. Reading from the labels. What will it be? Kitty? Here. How about some Tacitum 35? 10 kilos of it. This will buy us an island on some nice planet. Putting the invaluable canister into the shoulder bag, he hurries back up the steps. For those who weren't able to join my stream last night, if it was erroring out, uh, one of the things that they had contemplated, and this was the whole crew before they decided to expel the alien, was that they would like preserve some of the stuff that they got from mining, so that they, when they blew up the ship, they wouldn't have lost everything, which makes a, a total amount of sense um and and this is this is the sort of like greed coming back 
to bite them in the ass, so to speak. So you'll you'll see what I mean. And I also want to point out <laughs> before I go back to the script that in Alien Resurrection, uh, this greed also also doomed Elgin to his death because he kept on following the trail of guns. He knew that it was a trap being laid by the alien, but he still fell for it because he was greedy. So this is greed uh, trapping Roby. Interior engine room. Cut box in one hand, flamethrower in the other, Roby enters the engine room containing the massive star drive engines. He puts down his parcels and approaches the main control board for the engines. Studying the instructions, he begins to close switches one by one. A siren begins to honk throughout the ship. This is the part where I get to use my mother voice. There's a massive, massive lack of androids in the alien script, and I do love it still. Um, but I do relish these parts where I get to put on my computer voice. <clears throat> Attention. The cooling units for the star drive engines are not functioning. Engines will overload in 4 minutes 50 seconds. Attention. Ah, oh, that felt good. Finally, Roby closes the last switch. Shaking with nervous nervousness, he hurriedly picks up the cat box, bag, and flamethrower and hurries out the engine room. Interior corridors and ship. Roby hurries on, listening to the siren. Oh, I know that um, Dan O'Bannon didn't like adding the whole countdown to the end, but I really appreciate it. I think it adds this extra level to something that had already been happening and kind of it, it is in a way the magician's hand waving to um, take our attention off uh, what what is he's setting up for the end, which is the surprise. Uh, the computer sounds out. Attention, engines will overheat and main core will melt in four minutes, 30 seconds. Interior nose of ship. Roby comes hustling up to where the lifeboat is berthed. Hands full, he starts to enter the connecting passageway. Interior connecting passageway. The creature is waiting at the other end of the passageway inside the lifeboat. It hisses and starts towards, toward him. Interior nose of ship. Roby leaps out of the passageway, bounds to the controls, and throws the switch. The hatch door slams shut, locking the thing in the lifeboat. The computer sounds out again. Attention! Engines will overload in four minutes. Indecisive, Roby stares at the lifeboat launch button. The thing can be heard fumbling around in the passageway. Finally, he turns and bolts back toward the engine room. Interior, corridor, corridors and ship. Like a maniac, Roby runs through the ship, level after level, pounding down stairwells, his footsteps clanging metallically throughout the ship as he sprints for the engine room. The computer sounds out again. Attention, engines will overload in three minutes 30 seconds interior engine room the door crashes open and Roby comes running in the room is full of smoke and the engines are whining dangerously it is extremely hot in the room Roby instantly breaks out in a sweat he runs to the controls and begins throwing back on the cooling unit switches still the siren continues the computer sounds out Attention, engines will overload in three minutes. Roby pushes a button and speaks into it. Computer, I've turned all the cooling units back on. What's wrong? The computer replies. The reaction has proceeded too far. The core has begun to melt. Engines will overload in two minutes, 35 seconds. A look of terror comes onto Roby's face. He turns and runs from the engine room. Interior, corridors and ship. Again, Roby must run through all of the levels of the ship and this time up the stairs 
exhausted stumbling while the computer counts down. Computer sounds out. Attention, engines will overload in two minutes. Interior, nose of ship. Reeling and gasping for breath, Roby staggers into the vestibule where the lifeboat is berthed. He grabs the flamethrower and turns it toward the passageway. It is then he realizes that the lifeboat door is open again. Quickly, he glances around to see if the creature might be behind him. He advances on the passageway. Interior passageway. Dripping with sweat, his face mask of fear. I think uh, uh, Bannon was supposed to write his face masked with fear. Roby enters the passageway. Flamethrower grips tightly in his hands. He is goaded on by the siren and the computer. Here we go. Page 118. The computer sounds out. Attention. Engines will explode in 90 seconds. He makes it all the way to the end of the passageway, then sticks his head into the lifeboat. Interior lifeboat. His point of view, as he quickly scans the lifeboat, reveals that it is empty. Immediately, he turns and dashes back to head to the head of the passageway. There he grabs the cardboard, sorry. <laughs> there he grabs the cat box and bag, then runs into the lifeboat. The computer sounds out. Attention, engines will explode in 60 seconds. Interior, lifeboat. He comes in on the run, hurls the cat box and bag toward the front and does a dive over the back of the control chair. He is no sooner in the seat than he hits the launch button. Exterior nose of ship, out of space. The retainer clips drop away and with a blast of the ramjets, the lifeboat is launched away from the snark. Just want to pause it there. So one of the things that really annoys me in Aliens is that the Cheyenne dropship drops away from the Sulaco despite it being in orbit of LV-46, which means that there wouldn't be any gravitational pull from the planet to bring the ship down. And it doesn't have any jets blasting it away from the clip. And I like this detail that Dan O'Bannon included in this script, this early script of Alien is more medium sci-fi and, and more to my heart meaningful than in James Cameron's film. But I believe it does kind of serve the pace when they abandon the idea of the ship having to use the ramjets to propel itself away from the clip. So, you know, it depends on what you want out of the Alien series. Do you want hard sci-fi, medium sci-fi, more action? And I think it serves the plot for the action to happen and for the ship to not have to use the ramjets, even though it would only take a couple of seconds. Anyway, um, with the whole flow of that scene, I can't imagine the ramjets being used and that same sense of urgency happening. They managed to do it in Alien Covenant, but they were going to a discovery. They weren't doing a rescue mission. At least, you know, that's, that's how I explain away that flaw. All right, going back to the script. Interior lifeboat. Roby is frantically strapping himself in as the lifeboat accelerates away from the mothership. Exterior, space. The tiny pod of the lifeboat accelerates away from the larger bulk of the snark. The scene is strangely serene for such a, for such a deadly circumstance. Interior, lifeboat. Roby finishes strapping himself in. Then he reaches and grabs the cat box. The cat is yowling. Roby hugs the box to his chest and hunches his head down over it. Page 119. Five more pages to go. <clears throat> Exterior space. The snark drifts ever farther away as the lifeboat leaves it behind until it is barely a point of light. Then it blows up. 
an expanding orange fireball with pieces of metal flying in all directions. The shockwave hits the escape craft, joint, uh, jolting it and rattling everything inside it. Then all is quiet. Roby unhooks himself from the straps, rises and goes to the back of the lifeboat. He stares out through the porthole, his face bathed in orange light. Just want to stop it there. I really love that iconic scene of Ripley uh, looking out of the ship after she's exploded the Nostromo. Um, it's really, it's a really nice picture. <clears throat> Exterior space. What he sees is the boiling fireball now fading, fizzling away into nothingness and a couple of pieces of debris floating past interior lifeboat. Ruby's expression is mournful as he watches the final obliteration of his ship and friends. Behind him, the creature emerges from some hiding place. It has been inside the lifeboat all along. The cat screeches. Oh, sorry, but sorry. <sighs> Roby whirls and finds himself facing the thing across the length of the boat. It squats, then it pulls its pulls out its trophy, a man's arm. It begins to eat the arm, watching Roby. Oh, it's a bit too like monster movie sort of thing. At this point, I'm really glad they abandoned that sort of concept for the film. His first thought is for the flamethrower. Unfortunately, it lies on the floor next to the monster. Next, he glances around for the for any place to hide. His eye falls on a tiny locker containing a spacesuit with a door standing open. This is page twenty. He begins to edge toward the locker. The creature rises. He freezes. It throws down the arm, and with that. Roby dives for the open locker door and hurls himself inside and slams the door shut. <laughs> I feel like this is a scene straight out of um, Alien Isolation, which is based on Alien, but still. Uh, I think it's kind of good that in in the film, Ripley kind of sneaks into the locker and shuts the door quietly as the alien slowly emerges from its hiding spot. All right. Interior spacesuit locker. There is a clear glass panel in the door, and the thing puts its face right up to the glass, peering at Roby. The locker is so small that Roby's face is only inches away from the creature's. The sight is disgusting. It turns its head, looking at him in curiosity. Then the moaning of the cat distracts it. The creature waddles over to where the pressurized cat box sits. It bends down and peers inside. The cat yowls louder. It picks up the cat box in its tentacles. Interior spacesuit locker. Trying to distract the monster away from the cat, Roby taps on the glass. But the monster reacts so fast that its face is instantly back at the glass, st startling the hell out of Roby, getting no more interference from him. The thing returns to the cat box. Roby looks around. He spies the spacesuit, and quickly he begins to pull it on. I just want to pause it for a sec. So, so this is the part where obviously Roby uh, hasn't had time to settle down from his whole ordeal. Therefore, it is not naked. Um, but that scene was. Some people say is like really uh, gratuitous. Um, which it is. It's a, it's a science fiction. There's this whole, like, you know, uh, vulnerability in nudity and Sigourney or Ripley taking her um, clothes off, like stripping her skin off to, like, then get into the hypersleep bed makes a lot of sense because that's the way they started in the beginning. Um, in this, though, there is no such thing. And then it is reduced down to one sentence. Roby looks around, spies a spacesuit, quickly he be begins to pull it on. And that's it. Uh, it's it's just such a credit to 
the way filmmakers can change something so brief in an original script and have it build so much tension in a film. Anyway, I just wanted to highlight that point. Interior lifeboat. The creature picks up the cat box. Uh, sorry, this is not worded right, so I'm just going to say it the way it sounds in my head. The creature picks up the cat box with its tentacles and shakes it to see if there's anything inside. The cat moans. Interior spacesuit locker. Roby is halfway into this pressure suit. Uh, next page. Interior lifeboat. The creature throws the cat box down. It clangs and bounces. The thing picks it up again and it hammers against, hammers it against the wall, then jams it into the crevice in the wall. With one tentacle, it begins to pound the sealed cat box into the crevice. The cat has gone beyond hysterics. I wonder what the alien's doing to the cat. <laughs> Interior spacesuit locker. Roby pulls on the helmet, latches it into place, and turns on the oxygen with a hiss that the suit fills itself. In a rack on the wall is a long metal rod with a blunt rubber tip. Roby peels the rubber off, revealing a sharp steel point. Again, he raps on the glass. Interior, lifeboat. The creature turns. It faces the locker and peers at him. Interior, spacesuit, locker. Roby says, Try a little of this, you fucking bastard. He kicks the door open. Interior, lifeboat. The creature rises but just in time to catch the steel shaft right through its midriff. It makes a horrible noise and clutches at the spear. The yellow acid begins to flow from the wound. Before the acid can touch the floor, Roby reaches back and pulls the switch, blowing the rear hatch. In a poof, the tiny atmosphere in the lifeboat is sucked out into space and the bleeding creature along with it. Roby grabs a steel strut to keep from being sucked out but as the creature passes him, it wraps the end of a tentacle around his ankle. So just stopping there uh, for people who do not know, this is the very, very, very early script before even Geiger was brought on board, even though O'Bannon is credited for asking for Geiger to be on the project um, and uh, Ridley Scott securing the fact that... Uh, Geiger was allowed to work on Alien um, the Alien took a different form, it was more they envisioned it more like Cthulhu there is a, a concept art by Ron Cobb of it uh, what looks like standing on a pool table, I'm going to have to link um, the image in the blog so you can have a look at it because it's kind of funny all right, uh, exterior lifeboat out of space. Roby is now hanging halfway out the lifeboat with the thing clinging to his leg. It kicks at it with his free foot, but it won't let go. Interior lifeboat. Looking for any salvation, Roby grabs the hatch control lever and yanks it. The hatch slams shut, closing Roby safely inside the door but trapping the end of the creature's tentacle in the door jam. Instantly, it releases Roby, who staggers back. Exterior lifeboat out of space. The creature is now outside the lifeboat, in the vacuum, squirming, the tip of its tentacle caught in the closed hatch. Interior lifeboat. Where the tentacle is caught in the hatch, it is wounded, and is starting to foam with acid, eating away at the metal. Roby stumbles forward to the controls and pushes the lever labelled. Ramjets. Exterior lifeboat out of space. The jet exhausts are located in, at the rear of the craft, right where the creature is wriggling. The engines belch flame for a few seconds and then shut off. The incinerated creature tumbles slowly away into space. Interior lifeboat. Roby hurries and sorry, Roby hurries to the rear hatch and looks out after the thing. Exterior out of space. The burned mass of the monster drifts away slowly, sorry. The burned mass of the monster drifts slowly away into the 
a writhing, smoking, foaming mass. Oh, there's a picture. And you can kind of see what the alien looks like, at least to the description of Dan O'Bannon and Ron Cobb. Um, oh, there it is. <laughs> it's, it looks like it's weird. It's really, really weird. It kind of looks like a chicken on a skewer. Uh, last two pages, but it's really like the last page is like very brief. As it tumbles into the distance, pieces of it, sorry, pieces drop off it. It bloats, then bursts, then soggily, sending a spray of particles off in all directions. The last we see of it is a few smoldering rags dwindling into infinity. I just want to stop there. Oh, the alien is not indestructible in this. And I, I like the fact that the aliens could potentially hibernate in space, as shown in the much maligned uh, Alien Isolation animated series. It's one of my favourite scenes to see all of the aliens uh, clinging to the structures floating through space. I think that's one of the redeeming factors of the Xenomorph being so indestructible and so uh, strong. Uh, being uh, something that is formidable. Um, I don't like the fact that it could just be squeezed by space and be destroyed. So uh, thank you to whoever made the alien uh, indestructible. <laughs> Interior lifeboat later. The boat is repressurized and Roby is seated in the control chair. He seems calm and composed, almost cheerful. The cat purrs in his lap. Roby dictating. So it looks like I'll make it back to the colonies on schedule after all. I should be to the frontier in another 250 years or so. And then with a little luck, the network will pick me up. I'm not as rich as I was a couple of days ago, but I'm not exactly broke either. Incidentally, I did manage to salvage one souvenir out of this whole mess. He reaches down into the carrying bag and he brought on board and pulls out the alien skull. Roby continues, poor Yorick here should go at least part way toward proving I'm not a crank. I wish it was him we'd met in the first place things might have turned out different I want to stop there so Dan O'Bannon had a very slight concept that the crew of the Nostromo could have met the engineers which is something that is really cool because that happens in Prometheus and yeah things turned out different but they didn't turn out any better um, so yeah anyway back to the script he puts the skull down on a shelf and locks a glass lid over it Roby continues this is Martin Roby executive officer last survivor of the commercial vessel snark signing off Come on, cat. Let's go to sleep. Roby leans forward and switches off the recorder. Then he rises and carries the cat and walks to the hypersleep freezer, which stands open. He climbs in and stretches out on his back, holding the cat against his chest. With one hand, he presses, presses a switch and the lid closes over him. Close up of the alien skull. Watching Sentinel over the slumbering, slumbering Roby like some dead melancholy pixie. Exterior out of space. The lifeboat Snark 2 sails away towards its rendezvous with Earth 250 years from now. As Snark 2 drifts past camera, we suddenly see that a spore pod is adhered to the underbelly of the craft. Roll end titles and music the end 
So that's how the egg got onto the ship. <laughs> So, you know, as, as much as people dislike the idea of uh, Ripley having um, Alien 3 and how did the egg get on there, you know, all of these sorts of things came from the original scripts and they were like the whole like, da, 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 you know, it's never the end. Um, <laughs> So, so people can hate Alien 3 as much as they want, or uh, hate um, the prequels as much as they want, or, or hate uh, Resurrection. You know, all of it comes back to the original Alien script. All of these concepts were written down even before the movie was produced. And some people say that those things were discarded because they were failures as ideas that they wouldn't have worked, but we clearly have seen them work. And, you know, whether you like uh, the other Alien films or not, they are all owing to this original script by Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Chusek. Um, so I'm going to read the synopsis uh, because it's attached to the back of this uh, script. And then that would be it. That'll be the end of our analysis of uh, the alien scripts. And um, yeah, that'll be the end. And then I have to go head off uh, to the doctors because I've been fasting all morning. I've got a, some sort of like test <laughs> that I've got to do. So I'll read the synopsis and then I've got to go. But um, I can still chat to you uh, on uh, Twitch. I'll. Um, I'll leave it streaming so we can chat in the um, screen while I'm waiting for my uh, results. <laughs> Alright, synopsis. En route back to Earth, from a far part of the galaxy, the crew of the starship Snark intercepts a transmission in an alien language originating from a nearby storm shrouded planet. Mankind has waited centuries to contact another form of intelligent life in the universe. They decide to land and investigate. Their search takes them to a wrecked alien spacecraft whose doors gape open. It is dead and abandoned. Inside they find, among other strange things, the skeleton of one of the unearthly space travelers. Certain clues in the wrecked ship lead them across the hostile surface of the planet to a primitive stone pyramid, the only remnant of a vanished civilization. Beneath, beneath this pyramid, they find an ancient tomb full of fantastic artifacts. Lying dormant in the tomb are centuries-old spores which are triggered to, into life by the men's presence. A parasite emerges and fastens itself to one of the men's faces and cannot be removed. The examination by the ship's medical computer reveals that the creature has inserted a tube down his throat which is depositing something inside him. Then it is discovered that the parasite's blood is horribly corrosive is a horribly corrosive acid which eats through metal. They dare not kill it on the ship. Ultimately, it is dislodged from its victim and ejected from the ship, and they blast off from the Hell Planet. However, before they can seal themselves into suspended animation for the long voyage home, a horrible little monster emerges from the victim's body. It has been growing in him, deposited there by the parasite, and now it is loose on the ship. A series of ghastly adventures follow. They trap it in an air shaft and a man has to crawl down the shaft with a flamethrower. It tears a man's head off and runs away with his body. A man is crushed in the airlock door and the ship loses most of its air in a terrific windstorm. 
Another man is burned to death and eaten by the creature, and another is woven into a cocoon as part of the alien's bizarre life cycle. Finally, there is only one man left, alone, on the ship with the creature, and only six hours till his air runs out, which leads to a climax of horrifying, explosive jeopardy, the outcome of which determines who will reach Earth alive, man or alien. All right, that's it. Thank you for joining me, guys, for doing this analysis. And I'm really excited to go ahead and uh, release the Ridley Grams that I've been sent uh, of Alien Covenant before um, the crossing was extracted. Uh, and then we can kind of discuss about the changes for that. All right. Uh, and just to let you guys know, I've got a bunch of prizes that I'm still holding on to from Alien Day, which people haven't claimed. Um, I need people's addresses to send them, and I do want to send them. You just need to give them to me. So I'm going to got one here. That's Phileas Wayland. I already know your details. I can send them. Um, Robert Duffy hasn't claimed his perfect organism poster. Uh, and badges. E. Ripley 01968 hasn't claimed their postcards and badge. And... I've also got Robert Burkhart. We've got a Neomorph here waiting for you. So um, if you don't want your prizes anymore, that's cool. I'm going to have to do a redraw because it's been more than a month. And uh, I can't have this stuff sitting around my house any longer. It's taking up room. I've got a very small house. So yeah. <laughs> Those will have to be given away. So I'll do a redraw soon. I'll, I'll find a way to have everyone be part of the redraw. I've also got a signed copy of Resistance to give away. Um, on uh, Patreon now, I can't do draws. So for patrons, I'm going to do draws through Gleam and I will send you guys the link. You go into Patreon and apply through there and only people on Patreon will have access to that. Uh, I've also got this massive prize, which I, I've got all packed and ready to send out. And it's uh, art by Tristan Jones. Um, and I was going to send it to JB, but he hasn't sent me his details. So, dude, um, do you want your prize anymore? Because if you don't, I know some other people who will gladly have it. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks for joining me on my stream and uh, I will leave you in the starting screen and I will chat to you guys while I'm waiting for my results at the doctor's uh, to see why I'm having these like little tired things and my ear is playing up and all of these sorts of things. There's lots of very tiny problems with my body, nothing major. All right. That's why I want my robot body now. <laughs> okay. Thanks for joining me. Mwah. See you later. Remember to like, share, or support Studio Yutani on Patreon. And subscribe to yutani.studio to stay up to date. Transmission complete. This is Mother 9000, signing off.